Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. The webinar is, is getting on its way and starting here shortly. We're just going to make sure everybody gets signed on and, and logged in. So I'm going to give everyone just a second. All right. Well, good afternoon. We've got a great handful of attendees watching us today, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you to this wonderful program. So get ready for an exciting 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm Danielle Casey, president of Albuquerque Economic Development, Inc. And before we get things going, I just have a couple of quick housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded today. So following the program, we will be posting it on our website and making it available to anyone that missed it. Also stay tuned for a little bit of a press announcement recapping this information. Um, and, uh, and if you have any questions that don't get answered today, feel free to shoot us an email at AED. If anybody has technical issues or any general questions, uh, please go ahead and use the chat function in your Zoom toolbar uh, at the bottom or at the top, however you have it set. If you have a question for a speaker, we do ask that you please try to submit it using the question and answer tool. That's just easier for us to go through and make sure that we've actually caught everyone's questions and answered them live or even uh, through the Q&A function during the program. As a career economic developer, I have worked uh, in communities from very rural areas, developing economic development strategies and policies to urban communities with uh, one with the, the second largest employment center in Arizona, and, and then uh, also from a government to a, a nonprofit regional perspective. And so one common question that, that flows across all jurisdictions around the country, and again, whether it's a regional economic development effort, statewide, local, rural, urban, is how do we define success and return on investment in economic development? And a lot of uh, communities and regions say simply it's the number of jobs, but that's a, a very limiting look on the impact to an economy that any business is having or any economic development effort. So one of the critical tools in answering this question is the util utilization of an economic impact analysis model. And this is often referred to, and the model we use is referred to in, as a regional project assessment. So I am thrilled that AED has recently commissioned the development of a model customized to the greater Albuquerque region, the four county region for AED's proprietary use. And, and this is not only to better tell our story uh, or in our story in the region, but the story of the impact that the businesses have on the local, regional and state economy, whether they are new to the region or they've been here for a while. Um, this is not reinventing the wheel. This is not a new tool that economic developers have never used in our state. The, the economic development department in the state utilizes a tool and does a fantastic job analyzing state incentive programs, impacts for that purpose. Um, uh, the Mid-Regional Council of Governments, I understand, also does modeling. So this is something that is really a, a best-in-class activity in our profession. So here with us to make some opening remarks is an incredible community leader and a tireless champion of AED. And she has really been a strong voice for us in terms of the importance of the ability to utilize tools and data to better tell our story. So I have a big thank you to her for her championship of us getting this on board. Um, Roberta Cuperemo is recognized by Best Lawyer in America. She currently serves as the chair of Think New Mexico and previously served as a chair, of course, of Albuquerque Economic Development. She was the first woman to be president of the American Bar Association, the first woman to be president of the American Law Institute, and the only person to head both legal organizations. She has been president of the University of New Mexico Board of Regents, and she's also received the highest award of the American Bar Association, the ABA Medal. She was also elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, adding her name to a really prestigious and amazing list of members, including our very own George Washington, Albert Einstein, and Justices O'Connor and Ginsburg, among others. So uh, would you please uh, join me in welcoming Roberta Cuperino. Danielle, thank you so much. I'm just sorry my husband isn't on so that he can hear this. I may make you call him and repeat the whole thing. I could not be more thrilled uh, to be here today because this event is so deeply important to every single citizen 
of the Albuquerque metro area, which in my mind goes from Santa Fe down to Berlin. Uh, for years, I have known personally that every time we bring new jobs into Albuquerque and every time we help existing businesses grow, that the impact on all of our citizens is enormous. But we didn't have a way, a data-based way to tell our story. And now thanks to uh, Danielle's coming and thanks to so many people are supporting this effort, we have a magnificent opportunity to explain to everyone, legislators, to explain to mayors, city councilors, and to all the citizens of our area, exactly what the economic impact is on our bringing new businesses in and what happens when we help uh, businesses that have been here expand. So this is really enormously important. And it's a very sophisticated tool that you're gonna be hearing about. Uh, part of what happens is, as Daniel said, we often know how many jobs are created and we often know how much is spent in construction. What we don't know is what the broader economic impact is. And I'll give you a personal example. As many of you know, uh, in addition to being a lawyer, for years I helped run our family's Western wear uh, business and job wear business. And I always say that there were years when we wouldn't have survived without Intel because we sold workwear. And as Intel was expanding, our workwear business expanded exponentially. Now that was never anything that showed up when Intel said how much it spent in the community because these were their employers spending with the New Mexico business. With the kind of tool we're talking about today, we will be able to show so many things, including how jobs that we have in Albuquerque might impact Rio Rancho and Las Lunas, how jobs that are in Las Lunas impact the rest of the metro area. I'm just thrilled, Danielle, and I thank you for bringing this. And I also wanna thank you for the way that this is being presented so that uh, many people will have an opportunity to hear directly from our consultants and from you exactly what this tool is. So I want to very much thank Enterprise Bank, who is doing us the great service of supporting this webinar and supporting the entire project. Thank you, Enterprise Bank. Let me now introduce uh, the real professional about this. Uh, we're so lucky, I think, to have with us today, Sarah Murley, who is an economist and a principal at Applied Economics. She's had over 25 years of experience in regional economic analysis. Uh, we're in a community that really understands, I think, the importance of data. After all, we have the labs here, we have a major university, we have Intel, we understand the importance of numbers that are meaningful. She has performed analysis on the impact of new and expanding businesses as uh, all over the country. And she really is terrific at showing uh, exactly the economic impact that will be needed to support whatever incentives are being required in order to bring someone here. She analyzes the impact of non-residential developments and the annexation areas, transportation improvements, workforce development program, tourism venues, events, and she assists uh, organizations like AED in assessing and communicating the overall value, the return on investment of the business development programs. Based on our work with economic developers in New York and throughout the country, Sarah brings a unique and well-educated viewpoint to how state and regional organizations can use data to communicate their value to a whole variety of audiences and the return on investment that they create for their stakeholders. Sarah, we're so excited to have you. And I have to tell you, we're even more excited to have the tool. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for taking a little bit of your afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what economic impact analysis is, and also, of course, how it can be applied to economic development. And I will just um, apologize to you up front. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I'm having a little bit of connectivity issues this afternoon. So I, I greatly apologize if, um, if uh, we get some interruptions that way, but I'm hoping not. So I just wanted to start by um, sharing with you a little bit of information from the um, International um, City Managers Association. They did a survey a couple years ago of, uh, and this is more cities and counties, 
about how they evaluate economic development projects. And almost all of them, 90% of them count jobs. Um, and you know, over 80% look at the increase in the tax base, which I would interpret to mean capital investment. Um, but um, I don't know how many of them necessarily look beyond those direct impacts to look at the, the total economic impacts. I would say, however, that at the state level, I think that is very common almost all states um, use some sort of economic impact tool. And I would say that same applies to um, almost all large regional economic development organizations. There are a variety of different tools that they may use, but I think they all do some sort of modeling. How much that is done at the local level, I think, really varies from state to state and, and depends somewhat on um, you know, what the requirements of that state are. For example, in Texas, in order to use local economic development sales tax, you need to do some sort of impact. And so perhaps in states like that, it, it's more common. But um, certainly it is a best practice among uh, regional economic development organizations. And um, I know that AED has used a variety of less formal methods in the past for evaluating impacts. Um, but now there's a tool available that Applied Economics created that allows them to run impacts on all of their projects. Um, next, I wanted to talk about sort of two general ways that we can think about um, applying economic impact analysis to economic development. So you could look at the impacts of a single project. This could be a new company to the region. It could be an existing company that expands. Um, or we could just be looking at the economic contributions of a company that's already here. But the idea is to find a way to quantify the value of that company beyond just saying what the number of jobs are that they um, support or create. Also, you can look at the combined impacts of multiple projects. For example, all the projects that AED works with over a period of a year. And um, this is, uh, you might do this for a different purpose, which is more to talk about what is the value of economic development to the region and looking um, at the whole group of projects that you have worked with, not just looking at a single project. So you can obviously do both of these things, but for different purposes. So next, in looking at um, this notion of looking at a single project, either for public relations purposes, informational purposes, um, a lot of times if you're applying for some sort of a grant, uh, economic impacts are required, but um, generally it can just be useful in building support for a company. It can also be very useful in looking at um, an at-risk company that's considering leaving the region and trying to communicate how leaving not only means that you lose the jobs at that company, but there are other um, ripple effects in the economy. And then also, of course, looking at return on investment from that company, um, in particular, if they are receiving incentives. And so thinking about maybe looking at multiple years of information versus perhaps just one year that might be relate, re required just for informational purposes, but looking at over multiple years, if they're receiving an incentive or a multi-year period, um, this is a way that you can show what you're getting back versus what you're giving in incentives. And we'll talk in more detail about that. On the next slide, um, looking at um, how you might apply this, looking at multiple projects and how this can be used to show the value of an economic development organization like Albuquerque Economic Development. So um, certainly you can use this in annual reporting and um, a lot of our clients do to communicate you know, the total economic impacts of all the projects that they've worked with over a year. Um, this can be used in a fundraising campaign, either in a forward-looking projection sort of manner or uh, as a benchmark going forward, similarly in a strategic plan where you have certain goals and you can measure how you're achieving those goals and what the economic impacts are. Um, also have clients that use economic impact models to showcase major employers who are already in the region, but just to explain a little bit more about beyond um, just the people that work for that company, how their local supplier purchases and other activities they may be involved in impact the region. Um, and related to that is also a way that you can show how new companies that come to the area create demand for existing supplier businesses in the region which is important in terms of this really critical way that economic development 
um, supports existing businesses as well. Also by looking at multiple projects, it helps you to understand the relative value of different projects. Certainly not all projects are equal and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally looking at return on investment um, not for an individual company, but thinking about it for an economic development organization. So how do the impacts of the companies that you have worked with compare to the amount of um, funding support that you may get from both public and private sector stakeholders? So all of these are things that um, Albuquerque Economic Development now has the ability to do. Moving on, um, I want to talk a little more about what do we really mean when we say economic impacts. So there are three sorts of things that might trigger um, the need for an economic impact analysis to the extent that we're talking about new activity. Um, you may have an increase in output and you can think of output as um, sort of like gross revenues. It's value of wages plus value of supplies or inputs plus profits. If you see an economic impact figure quoted in a newspaper for, let's just say, a sporting event or a major company, um, that's output that they are talking about. Um, you may also have an increase in payroll, which could be an existing business that is expanding um, and, and most likely accompanied by an increase in jobs. And so these three triggers are also the ways that we measure economic impacts in terms of output, labor income, and jobs. Um, and so in terms of these three variables, we also look at impacts in three different ways. So on the next slide, um, there are direct impacts. So the company would provide information about how many jobs they have and how much payroll, and we would use economic multipliers to estimate the output. And I'll talk more about multipliers in a minute. We also use multipliers to estimate the indirect impacts. So this means um, that company makes purchases from local suppliers and non-local suppliers, but we're very much focused on what is being captured in the region. And that supports additional jobs and payroll at those supplier businesses. Um, and then their employees, the employees of the direct company and actually also the employees of the suppliers, we spend a portion of their income at local stores and service providers, and that supports additional jobs and wages. And so, um, when you're just looking at the direct impacts, you're really only seeing a fraction of what is actually going on in your economy. And so economic impact analysis is a way to get a, a more robust picture of really everything that is going on. So um, in the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit more about multipliers because there's a lot of um, perhaps misconceptions about multipliers. So. There are several national vendors of software that can be used to create multipliers. Um, we use Implan, that is what is the Implan uh, multipliers or what is used in the AED model. And so Implan and other similar companies um, work with these large matrices that are national that show who buys what from whom and what they make with it and who they sell to. And um, these giant matrix can, what the software does is make this local. And so, capturing only what is made and what is purchased in a local economy. And we use that to create multipliers. And so I will say that multipliers, while there's certainly no universal multiplier, they typically range between one and three. However, every industry has a different multiplier because different industries need different supplies and have different production functions. Um, and also every location has different multipliers. So um, the types of suppliers and even consumer goods that are available in one county, say Bernalillo County, are different than um, what might be available in Sandoval County or some other county in the state. Um, and so location matters. There are also different multipliers for jobs, income, and output because of three different units of measure. So it's complicated. There's, there's a lot of multipliers. And um, certainly the, the impacts or the multipliers are greater um, in an area where there's greater propensity to be able to buy from within the region. So the more interaction between businesses in the region, the greater the multipliers will be, which depends on where you are and what kind of purchases you might need to make locally. So this next slide is just kind of a graphic that illustrates this process. And so there's 
you have a project and they um, pay wages to employees and they make purchases from suppliers. Um, and then those employees go out and respend a portion of that money um, at local businesses. And that creates a second round of impacts. And that company makes purchases from suppliers and those suppliers have suppliers too, as do the retailers where the employees shop. So there are these iterative rounds of impact um, that create additional jobs and payroll and um, demand or sales at a whole range of different industries um, in the region. And keep in mind, we're really trying to capture what is happening in the region because certainly employees spend money outside the region, businesses make purchases from suppliers outside the region, but the goal here with using multipliers that are specific to the local area is to get a better picture of what is being captured locally. So I wanted to give you, sorry, I had a timer on, so I know when I was getting close on time, a, a quick example of um, different types of multipliers just to illustrate how much they vary. So for the four county metro area, the Albuquerque metro area, we look at primary metals um, manufacturing. Every one job in primary metals creates two additional indirectly induced jobs in other local industries. In comparison, personal services like the hair salons, nail salons, things like that. Every one job creates 0.32 other jobs in um, other local industries. Part of this is because we're looking at difference in goods supplier versus a service supplier, different wages. And this is not to say that personal services are bad. We all need a haircut every now and then, but they're not the focus of economic development. And there's a reason for that because they're just not creating the same level of impact um, as we might see uh, with a company that we would call a basic industry like primary metals manufacturing where they sell to um, have high value added and they sell to customers outside the area. So um, going, moving ahead, um, just thinking quickly about how economic developers can sort of impact those multipliers. Um, the idea really is to allow businesses or encourage businesses to buy as much as they can within the region, which requires them to be aware of what is possible to buy in the region. And also for economic developers to understand how businesses make decisions about purchasing, because that can really vary a lot. Um, and of course, partnering with um, other types of providers to try and, and um, keep as much of the inputs in the region, not outputs, but inputs um, within the region. I also wanted to touch real quickly on revenue impact. So on the next slide, um, these are distinctly different from economic impacts, but very much complementary. So when we talk about revenue impact, um, we generally are looking at major state and local revenues like gross receipts, property tax, um, state income tax. And we can look at taxes that are generated by the company directly and also by its employees. And I like to think of it in the way that Economic impacts show the level of activity, jobs, and income that are occurring in the private sector economy, while revenue impacts um, show the value to the public sector. To the, so to the extent that we're looking at return on investment in a tax incentive um, situation, revenue impacts are really the best way to measure that. Um, and um, sorry, I was just seeing a question there. However, there can be a dichotomy between companies that create high economic impacts and companies that create high revenue impacts. Those two things don't always go together. Sometimes they do, but they don't always. So on the next slide, um, looking at just comparing the retail sector to the manufacturing sector. So um, in retail, you typically have lower wages, um, limited local suppliers in that the products that are being sold are most likely not produced in the local region. Um, basically, the retailer is just providing a venue for um, someone to come in and make a purchase and perhaps some local transportation. And so that creates smaller economic impact. But because of their sales and gross receipts tax, it may create a sizable revenue impact. However, looking at manufacturing, tend to have higher paying jobs, higher value added, just the nature of the production process, more potential for suppliers in general, and certainly for local suppliers. And so typically larger economic impacts. But depending on whether they are making an intermediate product that they're selling to another manufacturer or they're typically selling uh, strictly outside the area um, and depending on their capital investment, manufacturers with a similar number of jobs to a retailer may or may not create uh, as great of revenue impact. So um, 
you know, it, it, you should not assume that economic and revenue impacts always rise together, although they are certainly complementary and important to understand um, both because they benefit um, the community in different ways. So um, just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to finish with talking about characteristics of companies that tend to cause them to create greater impacts. So higher average wages, um, tend to reflect more value added, higher economic impacts, also more generation of revenues by those employees in terms of um, taxable purchases and property ownership. Um, companies that have an existing supplier base in the region and also companies that tend to be very capital intensive also create greater economic impacts. Um, companies likewise with large capital investment are obviously gonna generate more um, property taxes. Um, areas that have a more diverse economic base provide the opportunity for more local spending by the business and by their employees. So that tends to result in greater economic impacts. Um, on the revenue side, taxable sales or purchases are going to increase the revenue impacts from the company. And um, more employees that live within the region, whatever that defined geographic area is, is going to mean that there are more um, employee-driven revenue impacts that are captured in that region as well. So um, that was a, a quick overview, but I hope that it has been helpful to you in understanding what economic impacts are and how they can be used to quantify the value of economic development. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. It is it is a ton of information, but it's really tremendous material. And, uh, you know, if you're a little bit of an economic development geek like I am, you're loving this. I'm actually getting messages from my team saying, she is so good. This is wonderful information. So, uh, so thank you. So if you can please stick around, uh, would, would love it if you would, uh, if you would hold on and hang out with us today. And, uh, and next we have a little bit of a treat actually for our, our many viewers here today. Um, thanks again to Enterprise Bank and Trust for sponsoring this program. Our friend Stan Sluter is going to be leading a short Q&A session with two of our wonderful local employers and business leaders. And they're going to just talk a little bit about their perspectives and the significant economic impact that their companies make in our region every day. Uh, as the market president at Enterprise Bank and Trust, yeah, even Stan's LinkedIn page, I was loving this, Stan. It includes in his titling, Advocate for Economic Development, Working to Grow the Economic Opportunity in Albuquerque. So I don't think there's anything I can say that's more amazing than that. So thank you for being a champion. We're honored to have you with us today for this important discussion. So Stan, you want to take it away and uh, introduce our panelists and then host our Q&A? Great. Thanks, Danielle. Um yeah, so it's my pleasure to kind of host this Q&A and moderate it. We've got two uh, wonderful speakers today. We'll start by introducing uh, Mindy Cook. She's the Corporate Services Site Manager at Intel Corporation in New Mexico. The Intel New Mexico site is a 200-acre campus with over 5 million square feet of space, where she and her team are responsible for facilities operations, construction, building maintenance, regulatory compliance, employee services, site security, and environmental health and safety. That's a lot. Uh, as a banker, I know a little bit about compliance, but not nearly that much. Um, Mindy joined Intel in 1988 and has been there ever since, where she has held various site, regional, and corporate positions in facilities operations, contract management, and environmental health and safety. Outside of Intel, Mindy has been active in a number of organizations, and she currently serves on the Executive Committee of Albuquerque Economic Development and became treasurer in 2019. We're also joined by John Jacobs, who serves as a stockholder and member of the board of directors at Flagship Food Group and is the CEO of Desert Premium Logistics, where his focus is growing flagships 3PL Logistics Food Grade Frozen and Dry Storage Division. John has over 45 years of experience in food manufacturing, logistics, materials management, quality management, and supply chain leadership. John and Mindy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Stan. We've Thank got you. A Happy to be questions. here. We'll kick off and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, first of all, I'd like to know a little bit more about your company's presence and investment in the region and growth over time. And John, we'll start with you and then we'll kick it over to Mindy. Okay. Uh, well, Flagship Food Group is uh, 
owned by Creo Capital Partners, which is a private equity firm. And the major stockholder is a gentleman by the name of Rob Holland, who came from uh, uh, the private sector. And uh, what Creo Capital Partners does is they have always bought companies. They've really never started any company. I sold my company, Soteri Distribution, uh, back in 2008 after spending uh, 25 years with a company called Unilever. And I had uh, in distribution and management. And Flagship has purchased uh, 505 Salsa about 10 years ago. And when they purchased 505 Salsa, it was about a $6 million business. Uh, and today it's uh, uh, right now about a $45 million Salsa business. And as a company, Flagship Food Group is about a $300 million company. We have 500 employees. And in Albuquerque, we have 120 employees. And uh, we have offices in Denver, Los Angeles, Albuquerque, Boise, Idaho, Minnesota, and California and Wichita, Kansas. Uh, but 505 is a, the local brand. And we've stayed local and we're, most people don't know it. We're the only salsa company that actually only uses New Mexico product uh, from the Hatch Valley down in Las Cruces. Uh, a lot of salt companies use uh, product out of Mexico, which is still a good product, but we've stayed uh, local. Everything we do here, we purchase local from anybody in the New Mexico area. We do not purchase anything outside of uh, the Albuquerque or New Mexico area. So that's kind of a, a brief overview of uh, flagship. Uh, you know, our brands are TJ Farms, uh, Lily Bee's, uh, Hatch Kitchen, 505 Salsa, and then we do private label for Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Sadie's, and uh, a little bit for uh, Costco. So that's about it in a nutshell. <laughs> Sorry about that. John, thanks for that. And Mindy, give us a quick uh, rundown on Intel, please. Um, well, you know, first of all, John made me hungry, so it's a good thing that I had lunch. Um, and uh, you know, certainly, I think most of us recognize those brands, and um, you know, are, are happy to have them representing the state of New Mexico. I'm also happy that Intel is representing the state of New Mexico. We are celebrating our 41st anniversary this year. And uh, the site began with just uh, 25 employees. We have a, a couple of really great throwback pictures that I've seen recently with uh, uh, a small group of folks uh, standing in the dirt in front of our first building, which is up on the uh, northwest corner of the campus. Uh, today, we employ over 1,800 uh, people directly. We have about 2,000 contract workers that work with us on the site, and, and about 700 of those people actually are on site daily as well. So we have a, a, a good sized number of folks, not quite as many during COVID uh, that are on site on a daily basis, but, but that is our operation and our footprint here in New Mexico. You know, I talked about that, that first building, it was, uh, it was uh, called Fab 7 and it was our first manufacturing operation. Uh, we have continued to, uh, to build and expand our semiconductor operations um, over the years that we've been here. And, um, you know, most recently uh, expanded not just in the manufacturing, but in the research and the technology development space with some of Intel's uh, latest products that are intended and designed to simplify and really optimize the semiconductor packaging memory and connectivity. And um, as, as some of us were chatting as we were gearing up for, the, for today's session is just how, um, how important that has been over the past year with uh, that connectivity and being able to work from uh, the different places, not just our workplaces, but, but really what that technology enables. So it's a little bit about Intel in New Mexico. Great, thanks, Mindy. Um, next, I'd like to know, have, have your companies ever conducted an economic impact analysis? And if so, were there any surprises for you and what might surprise the public? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start this one. And, and in fact, uh, we actually just published our, uh, our 2020 RISE report and, and RISE stands for Responsible, Inclusive, Sustainable and Enabling Practices. And it, it really is the New Mexico alignment to our corporate strategy. We've um, 
published a, a corporate report for many years and our goals that go with that. Uh, that particular report, if anybody wants to see it, is at uh, www.intel.com uh, slash New Mexico spelled out. Um, you know, and I, I think we heard about it earlier is when when we talk about economic impact, there's that, that primary or that direct impact that you hear about, but you certainly have to consider what the, what the ripple effects are that sometimes get overlooked. Um, you know, for us, we do have tools uh, that do some of the, uh, the calculations that we've talked about. And in our, in our 2020 report, a couple of stats, that I'm, I'm gonna look down and make sure I quote the right numbers here. Uh, we have an estimated uh, $1.2 billion economic impact in 2019. So there's, there's some lag in some of the data to get all of that put together. Uh, and we also spent um, 200 million uh, with New Mexico based organizations in 2020. And so, you know, you can see from some of the things that Sarah was talking about and that capital investments, uh, the direct and the indirect impact and, and just how much of a difference that they uh, can and do make uh, in, in the local community. Um, and that's, you know, really, I think something that is just a part of being uh, that corporate citizen as well. And, uh, and, you know, an important part of the overall economic development story. Great, thanks. How about you, John? Have you uh, guys over at 505 ever done an economic impact analysis? They did uh, prior to me. Uh, I just moved here in August from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, but prior to investing the, the plant, they invested $30 million in it. And basically they looked at here and they also looked in the Las Cruces area and really the labor force and the uh, tax incentives and uh, financial incentives were just much better in the Albuquerque region. And then when they started Desert Premium Logistics, the group that I'm trying, it was about a $5 million investment and they decided to do it here also as opposed to the Las Cruces area. So uh, I guess the surprise that would be that the tax incentives and the uh, tax abatements and financial incentives just were uh, much better here in the Albuquerque region, which speaks highly of this area. Great. Thanks, John. You know, we always kind of sell or hear about, read about when we invite new companies, uh, new industries into the market. Um, but I'd like to know what kind of what you guys uh, would talk to us for a minute about what you think about the importance of retaining and growing our, our current local co uh, companies. John, why don't we start with you? Okay. What was that question again, Stan? I'm sorry. Just kind of talking about the uh, kind of comparing, uh, attracting new industries and companies, but also retaining and helping our current companies grow, our local companies grow. Yeah, basically what uh, what we do, as I said a little bit earlier, we strictly deal with uh, local companies here. You know, when we buy equipment, we buy cardboard. Uh, you know, we deal with the local companies here and we've reached out to uh, almost every, uh, you know, in the restaurant association, we belong to the restaurant association and, you know, we support, uh, you know, local charities. Uh, we have a uh, gifting program where we'll match up to $10,000 of any employee that wants to invest in, uh, you know, a charity that, you know, they, that they can justify to us. So, you know, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but uh, we're very focused on local. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Mindy, you and Intel have been a champion of our local community for a long time. Uh, give us your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, and, and certainly asking this question of somebody who works at a local firm, we probably all are a bit biased <laughs> in, in terms of, um, you know, what does it mean to be able to uh, support and retain the local firms? Um, you know, but but it is it is key to to growing our local economy. Uh, you know, we by by keeping a firm or by growing a firm that's already here, we, we continue to benefit from the economic impact in the community. And and Sarah spoke a little bit in one of her comments about if you were doing an assessment, you could also see what the uh, I'll call it the reverse impact was if a company were to leave. Um, you know, which which I, I think intuitively all of us can appreciate that there's an impact. Um, you know, not only would you lose the, the company, the jobs, uh, you know, the people that are a part of that, 
But on the flip side, you can imagine that if we started to see that trend in the community where local firms weren't supported and were choosing to go somewhere else, um, I would think, at least I would, if I was uh, representing a different organization and looking at relocating to the area, I would wonder why the other companies are leaving. So, you know, I, I think it does have the potential to create a perception uh, that at least puts a question mark in somebody's mind as well. So uh, there's all the benefit of keeping, uh, keeping ourselves strong for uh, the businesses that are located here. Uh, and that just, I think, strengthens the area for anybody else that is looking to relocate or, or just grow into a new market. Great, thanks. We've got a question here in the Q&A. Um, since data out is only as good as data in, what is the mechanism by which AED will gather data specific to a certain project, whether it's relocation or expansion? Hey, Stan. Well, this one was my Sarah to address that. answer and, and maybe even lean on Sarah on. And then, and then this is also a cue for anybody else with questions of the panelists to toss them in in our last few minutes. This is a, a wonderful question uh, from one of our, our really fantastic partners in New Mexico Economic Development Department. And, and gathering the data and getting good information in is absolutely, uh, you're, you're right, it's absolutely critical. So one of the things we have is an input form that we give to companies and we ask them to share to the absolute best of their knowledge, you know, their planned investment dollars, um, the, the jobs that they're hiring, those occupations, what they plan to pay, what their estimates are for capital investment. Um, what they are either paying for the building purchase of the lease. And, and we obviously keep this information as confidential as, as the company needs it to as well. This is also very similar data that's collected at the state level or regional level when they're running models. So it's, it's pretty, pretty standard. The other thing we can do though, if we're running an estimated project, there are also a number of places where we can go out and look at assumptions. So, you know, for example, there are a lot of sources out there that can give you a general assumption of certain types of retail and what that general dollar per square foot is in that type of retail. So you can start to estimate tax revenues. So there's a lot of different ways we do that, but uh, Max, you're absolutely right. Junk in, junk out. So we do rely on the companies, but then we also look at that data and we will, we will test it against kind of industry standards as well to make sure that things are good. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's funny, we've seen a few of the impacts run by the state recently on projects we've partnered on. And what we're excited about is we're looking at our model and going, wow, the numbers are coming in very close, which means our models are, are, are both built with a lot of uh, similar data in the background, which is positive. Great. I always thought that's interesting, right? We do have a chance to go back and check our math, right? We can go back after what we predicted five years ago and see what actually happened. And so I think it's a nice to be able to kind of chew up that those predictions. Um, no, we've just, we don't have anything else in the Q&A right now. I don't see anything in the chat. So I'll ask one more question if we've got time. I state often that I believe that economic development is not just a business issue, but it's also a social equity issue as well. I wonder what, uh, what you guys thoughts on that. And we'll start with Mindy, if, if you don't mind sharing your thoughts on that idea. Really, I, I agree. Uh, certainly, just in its simplest form, is you know that social equity is is access um, to the same tools, right? And and so as we think about um, developing uh, businesses and supporting economic development in the area, it gives us an opportunity to you know have a fair and equitable access for you know supportive people in any of the neighborhoods, public policy. Um, you know, products, et cetera. So, you know, it's uh, the, the two definitely go together and, uh, and I think together give us a chance for um, just continuously improving our local community. Great, thanks Mindy. John, do you have anything to add or any other thoughts on that? You no, know, uh, I think I've said it before, you know, we're very active in relationship to uh, the Restaurant Association and we support local restaurants. We uh, the Hispanic Chamber we're members of, and then, you know, the community that we're here, uh, you know, Benny Keith just built a huge building over here, and, you know, we do uh, different things with uh, different companies in relationship to uh, job sharing, you know, if they need something, we try to pitch, pitch in, and uh, during the pandemic, even though the business uh, went down a little bit, you know, we didn't lay any employees off, and, uh, you know, we maintained, you uh, all the employees and health benefits and everything. So, you know, we, we tried to 
keep everybody uh, uh, alive and well. <laughs> Great. I see Roberta and Sarah have joined us back on camera. Do you guys have anything you want to uh, say as we, as we kind of wrap things up as we come to the end of our 45 minutes? Yeah, I just wanted uh, to answer your question in a different way, uh, Stan. I think the most important thing you can do to help uh, with poverty in our state, which is a huge problem, is to make sure that people have an opportunity for good jobs. And good jobs to me are jobs with good wages and uh, fine benefits and an opportunity to learn often new skills. And I, I really think that uh, this is why economic development on all fronts is key to making our state a better place for the people who live here. Yeah, I agree. There's no, there's nothing better than opportunity uh, and, and growth than to, to recognize the, the dignity of the human person. Sarah, how about you? Oh, I was just going to comment, you know, inclusivity is becoming a, a big topic in economic development nationally right now. And one of the trends that I am seeing is that regions are starting to incorporate some inclusivity measures um, into their incentives as a way to um, make it clear that, that that is part of their priority. And um, there are a lot of interesting ways to do that, but um, it's another way to make sure, uh, at least for the companies that you're incentivizing, that um, that in inclusivity and equity is actually happening. Well, sounds like Sarah just gave us a topic for a future webinar. <laughs> Love it. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, to all of our speakers. Really could not do this without you. And just, again, appreciate your partnership and your support and, and your knowledge sharing today. Thanks to everyone who tuned in to learn a little bit more about our efforts to be a data-driven regional economic development organization. So if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. If you are an AED investor or partner and would like any assistance evaluating the local impact that, that your operations make to the economy or something you're looking at does, we'd love to hear from you. And, uh, and finally, for everyone out there, we ask that you please mark your calendars for some upcoming programs. We have a really cool event coming up uh, as well on May 13, and we are actually going to be unveiling a joint report on talent and industry in our region that we've partnered with CBRE on to produce. Uh, and so we're going to unveil this in the community, and then this is also going to become a significant external marketing tool for us in telling our story. So um, in addition to that, please also stay tuned regarding a very critical endeavor, which is our 2021 strategic plan. It will get, be completed in the June timeframe and then unveiled to the full region after that. So more information is at abq.org 2021 strategy. And, uh, and I believe here's the cool thing that Elena on our team, who I want to thank for being our, our uh, technical producer. If you, if you hold your camera in front of your, if, if you hold the camera on your phone in front of your screen right now and put that little orange box in it, it'll take you to the events and information page on our website without you having to do a thing. So, uh, so check that out. It'll make it really easy. You don't even have to type anything in. Thank you all for joining us. We will have this program recorded and online and I wish you a wonderful afternoon and see you next time. Thank you.